Hey everyone, uh, welcome back. Uh, so we wanted to come on here to provide a uh, update uh, to SB9. Uh, the city of Los Angeles just released their implementation memo and uh, are accepting applications. So I'm here with my partner, Alex, to kind of go over that. And it's kind of a redo. If you uh, hopefully are a subscriber, if you're not, please subscribe now uh, and, uh, and like <laughs> this uh, video because our last video, we uh, held a webinar and uh, it was live. We had some kind of bugs and, and uh, Alex's video wasn't recorded. So we want to make sure we're, we're on here. And so Alex is here now. Thanks, John. And thanks everybody for joining today. Uh, just to recap from our last webinar, you know, we covered uh, a higher level overview of what Senate Bill 9, what we call SB 9, is, uh, what qualifies for SB 9 projects, what SB 9 does, uh, what jurisdictions are starting to do to incorporate SB 9. Um, so we've covered that in our last webinar. I don't want to spend time uh, covering that again today. What I want to do today is basically focus in and narrow in on the city of Los Angeles's uh, memorandum that has been recently released to incorporate and start processing uh, the provisions of Senate Bill 9. Very excited for this because as I'm sure a lot of you guys are know, uh, know already, uh, Senate, uh, the city of Los Angeles is a very big real estate market. Um, it's also where we're headquartered, where our home base is. Um, so very excited to, to cover this today and without further ado, uh, let me turn on my share screen here. So first of all, this, this uh, let me get this off my screen. This is available straight on the city planning's homepage right here, right? Memo of implementation of Senate Bill 9. Click on that and you will get this memorandum. Now, I, uh, I made some comments to it, so I'm going to walk through my version that I've saved here uh, and and you know you can see that I have some other stuff open on my screen. It's not just the memorandum. This memorandum came out with a package of, of other information and other documents. So we'll walk through everything today. Uh, so first of all, this was, was this was actually released on February 10th. Um, I think it was just a couple of days prior. The city council voted to give planning another 90 days to release this, and then they came out just a couple of days later with this memo, which was amazing. Um, and this is just from, first off the bat, this is an interdepartmental memorandum. So this is the Department of City Planning in combination with uh, Department of Building and Safety and LA Housing. So everybody's coming together, all the all the bright and best minds uh, to incorporate uh, SB9 within the city of Los Angeles. Uh, so I'm literally just going to walk through this memo and try and try and explain some of the things on here. OK, uh, so right off the bat, it's just a summary of the provisions. Um, one thing that I really, really like about what Los Angeles has done here is they have identified um, what zones qualify. So what zones are actually considered to be single family zones within the city of Los Angeles. And John, if you remember uh, in our, uh, as we're working on our map for the city of Los Angeles, I think there were like 1900 different zoning designation combinations that we found. Um, so, you know, take a look at this list here. And if your property is not located in one of these zones, then you do not qualify for SB9, right? So these are SB9 only applies to single family zones. Right now, there's other disqualifications of using SB9 as well. You know, one is if you're within a wetlands uh, hazardous site, a waste site, if you're identified within a floodplain, a floodway, a conservation area, or if you have a hab if you're um, within a habitat for um, uh, certain species, protected species. Um, also, if your site is uh, historically designated, if you're in an HPOZ, or if you have a historic property on your site. You just flat out, those just those sites just are disqualified. Now, one thing I love about the city of Los Angeles is that they've recognized the provision within SB9 that says that you can also be within a very high fire hazard severity zone or an earthquake fault zone as long as you comply with certain standards. And they've identified this from the, the law, the, 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 the state section, but the city also has building standards that you'd have to comply with. Okay, um, the city has gone on to identify uh, just basically, re re they do a lot of this, you know, regurgitating of what the state, uh, the state law 
says, but um, here, if your property, if you have, uh, if your property is designated uh, rent stabilization ordinance uh, protection, um, if you have RSO units on your site, um, then, and, or if your property has been rented within the last three years, even, even if it's not RSO, um, then you cannot impact that existing building. You cannot, um, you cannot split that existing building into two units, for example. Also in the city's fact sheet, they say that if you have two units on your property existing that are RSO or rented, you can't split that those, the, uh, you can't apply for a lot split and split those units. So then you have two single family on either lots, right? Uh, and there's, there's a whole slew of other protections that are associated with that. One thing that I'd like to point out, and I don't, I don't know if this is something that gets overlooked or if people don't, aren't aware of this, but if your property has used the Ellis Act to, to remove units within the last 15 years, they go back 15 years, then you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, apply for SB9 uh, to impact that existing building, right? Um, so uh, these are all the, you know, if, if you have units on your site that have been rented, and, uh, and, and we'll get into that in a little bit in terms of what the city requires to prove that. Um, the, the general summary, general overview uh, that the city has incorporated for SB9, um, you know, that they've identified that there's basically two processes for SB9. There's the urban lot split, which is not, which is just, it's it's literally taking your existing lot and, and splitting it in half or a 60-40 split, um, or just using SB9 to utilize a, the two units on your property, right? Uh, take an existing building, create a duplex or um, or build another dwelling unit on your property. Um, so this this is a, a summary of those provisions. Right off the bat, the city uh, the city identifies that um, the city cannot impose an objective zoning standard or subdivision or design standard that would preclude your uh, you from developing your property with uh, new. 800 square foot units, right? And this is very important as we get into uh, the rest of the ob objective standards. So setbacks, the city is identifying the same setback standards as the state, which is four, si uh, four not less than four feet uh, for side and rear, unless it's an existing building um, or being or a new building being reconstructed in the same place, then that cannot be all the way to property line. Um, but then they say, but front yard setbacks shall apply. Now, this is also, I would argue, the same uh, threshold for, you know, you cannot physically preclude the construction of an 800 square foot unit, right? Um, if this, if, if your property cannot honor this requirement. Historic structures don't apply. Um, automobile parking, if you're within a half mile walking distance uh, of a high, either a high quality transit corridor or a major transit stop, uh, you're, you do not have to provide parking. Also, if you're within uh, same distance of a, a vehicle car share pickup location, the city's provided, you know, the code sections uh, identifying the high quality transit stop and major uh, high quality transit corridor and major transit stop. Uh, but then the, uh, the, the car share is identified in the accessory dwelling unit ordinance. Um, connected or adjacent structures, they, the city has specifically raised this, this point, uh, which I love that they've incorporated this into their memorandum. There's a provision within the zoning code which says that if you have more than uh, one building, one residential building on your property, then your that property has to have direct access to the street. And if it does not, I mean, that's literally like your front door opening onto the street, right? Or, you know, with no obstruction. Or... If you cannot provide that, then like your rear unit, for example, then you have to meet certain passageway requirements, right? Um, and, that, and that passageway has to be specific dimensions. It has to be uh, uh, unobstructed to the sky. Um, and then there's also a uh, separation of buildings, right? So there's, that's, there's a setback standard and then there's a separation of building standard. What the city is saying here is that they're saying, yes, these standards still apply because they're in the zoning code. However, we cannot use that to deny your project, right? So this is kind of where that, um, that, that section above here, where it says the city cannot apply an objective zoning standard, right, to prohibit the development of your unit, of your 800 square foot unit. This is the same thing. So, but the city is saying, we will review this as part of your lot split application. And 
basically whatever you can provide is what we'll have to work with, right? Um, so, so, so the city is going to want to see some type of passageway, if possible, to the street. Um, denials, they've come right out the gate and said, look, uh, denials, we, we are very limited. The city is very limited on denying project. This is pursuant to SB9. Um, the, in order to deny a project, the, the city would have to make a finding based on a preponderance of evidence that the proposed housing development project would uh, have a significant, uh, sorry, a specific adverse impact uh, upon the public health and safety or the physical environment and for which there is no feasible method to satisfactorily mit mitigate or avoid the specific adverse impact. That's a really tough finding to make, right? Uh, for the city to deny your project. All right, moving on, the city uh, is identifying that uh, that they are providing a, a process that's a ministerial review process, uh, whether you're doing the, the two unit uh, development or the urban lot split, uh, identifying uh, again, the, the minimum unit size, but they also are saying, you know, where some cities, some jurisdictions are saying, we don't care what your zoning designation is, whatever, we're saying, they, we're gonna impose a new ordinance that says your SB9 unit, is re required to be a minimum of 800 square feet and a maximum of 800 square feet, right? The city of Los Angeles is not doing that. They're saying that that your unit uh, shall be permitted a minimum of 800 square feet, right? But if your if your floor area of your property allows for more than that, then you can accommodate a larger unit, right? For your SB9 unit. So uh, on that, is there? Uh... I think this question has come up a few times. So uh, is the uh, kind of blanket floor area ratio for single family point or for one unit 0.45? And is that kind of what you have to adhere to or is it going to be site specific still? Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, good, great question, John. So, uh, so your, your, I don't think that that's universal, the, the 0.45, like for the R, R1 zone, for example, is a 0.45. I know that off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, let's say you have a, a 10,000 square foot lot, just round numbers, mm -hmm. then your max floor area for your site total combined for the lot is 4,500 square feet. Right. Right. And that would depend on if you're doing the lot split, then that's, you know, split between each lot is going to have 45% floor area standard for each right. lot, right? Right, right. Um, so you're, that's your maximum, your total maximum of all the floor area, all of the floor area on your property, right? right. What happens if your, uh, if your existing unit uh, is already taking up the majority of that floor area, right? That's where SB9 comes in. SB9 comes in and says, okay, we've met the 45% threshold maximum for the the floor area of your property however that doesn't matter because we can go over that and as long as you're limited to 800 square feet right okay. per, per okay. unit right per sb9 unit so so you know it's basically 1600 square feet per lot is you know the city cannot prohibit you from uh from developing that that's great that's powerful it's yeah it's it's, it's it really is it's fantastic um, and, you know, there's a similar provision within accessory dwelling units. And, and this is great. Um, the, the city, I, I'm going to read through this, this paragraph sentence by sentence here, uh, because, you know, the, the city has, um, you know, they've, they've taken a bit of a different direction on accessory dwelling units because they have, the city has an accessory dwelling unit ordinance put in place already, right? Um, so first of all, they're saying adding a, an ADU to a lot with an existing or proposed home does not create a two unit development. So they're saying that that if you have a single family and you want to add a, an accessory dwelling unit, we're not going to count that as a dwelling unit, right? Mm -hmm. um, ADUs and junior ADUs are not permitted on parcels that use, use both the urban lot split and the two unit development, either together or at different times. So here they're saying... While you can do a single family and an ADU, right, um, if you take advantage of the SB9 process and use the lot split provision to create two new units on both lots, mm -hmm. right, you cannot then also add accessory dwelling units on top of that. So right. we're saying that four units is the maximum here. Right. 
Um, and that's generally consistent, I think, with most jurisdictions. Most jurisdictions are not wanting to have, you know, uh, the more than four units on, a, on an existing single family lot. And let's be honest, it's going to be really difficult physically to fit, you know, more than four units on. Unless on you have an right. acre or so, maybe in Rancho Cucamonga or some other. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Um, so, okay. So um, uh, where we leave off on any lot that was created using SB9, the SB9 urban lot split provision without a two unit development, no more than two units, including ADUs and, and junior ADUs may be permitted. Mm. Okay. So, um, so I think that's pretty self-explanatory. This last sentence here is great. The accessory dwelling units or junior accessory dwelling units may be permitted on lots that use only the two unit development allowance to allow more than two units pursuant to the accessory dwelling unit ordinance. So here, what they're saying is you can use the two, if you don't use the urban lot split, you can put two new units on your property and still avail yourself to the accessory dwelling unit ordinance without doing going through the headache of doing the urban lot split. Now, I mean, there's pros and cons to that, right? And John, I think you've talked about from a financial aspect, when you, when you create new dwelling units, official dwelling units through the subdivision process from a financing standpoint, that's a lot more advantageous than just using uh, the accessory dwelling unit provision to create more density on your property, right? Because there's other, on the financial side of things, as I understand it, and John, you'll be able to explain this a lot better than I can, but getting comps, right? For example, appraisals, uh, you know, to finance that project is a lot more difficult if you're not a true dwelling unit. Yeah, I think that webinar that you shared uh, and uh, the, uh, that the White House had in, in regards to ADUs and how that's helpful and how where I think, um, you know, where it could be helpful was uh, there was someone on the panel from Fannie Mae and also from uh, Umpqua Bank, and they're piloting a program now, uh, hoping it will scale is to finance ADUs. And so that, again, is the main, that's also a deterrent, is you can't get the value based on not enough comps. That could be solved with more utilization and time. But the financing aspect is when we do a lot urban lot split here and utilize SB9 to build a duplex, a duplex is recognized. So you, you will get the value and you also get financing. An ADU is not recognized both on the valuation side and also on the financing side. That's why you can't get a mortgage on an ADU most of the time. And that's the challenge. If, if they pilot that program, we're hopeful it does scale and it becomes something widely available. Yes, then uh, 100% this um, shouldn't be an issue. And, and alternatively, the from a processing standpoint, the advantage of doing the two units and if you could do you know accessory dwelling units or even if you're just creating you know the one, is that you don't have to wait for the subdivision process, right? right. To split your lot, you can go straight to permit, right? right. So there are, there's advantages, and but obviously if you can't finance it, then <laughs> you can't finance well, it. No, right? no, segue, we'll help you finance it. So I want every homeowner that's watching this, reach out to us, contact Brickwork LA. We're, we're creating a program where we'll help finance it. So if you want, are interested in this, but you need to partner uh, with us to help finance it, we'll do it. Uh, in terms of at least investment uh, finance or investment capital. So we are starting uh, right now to uh, um, essentially early works to figure out what the homeowners want. What we've already generated in a waiting list is most of the homeowners want to partner 50-50 on doing this. So we're mm -hmm. right now working with our partners to get that set up. So by all means, if, if financing or capital or savings is an issue for any of this that we're talking about, reach out to us. We have a solution ready. Fantastic. All right, back to the memo. Uh, we have uh, the on-site way. So if you have a septic tank on your property, you're not connected to the sewer, you're going to have to do a percolation test within the last 10 years. Uh, Short-term rentals still not allowed. Uh, it's built into the state uh, ordinance. Okay, so here is uh, additional provisions for urban lot splits. Uh, that they're, they're identifying that from the state, you know, 40%. You can't go less than 40% of your lot area, you know, with the new lot splits. When you create a new lot, uh, a 60-40 split is the, is the maximum deviation you can go. Um, the, uh, and, and also your lots cannot be smaller than 1,200 square feet. 
Uh, unit size again, not less than 800 square feet. Um, two unit maximum uh, dedication. So the, uh, the as a result of your lot split application, the city cannot impose dedication. So if your property, um, if your street standard requirement, uh, if your street ha is is substandard and has to be widened, right, uh, would otherwise have to be widened as a result of your development project. The city, as uh, this is through SB nine cannot require you to dedicate your property, to ded dedicate land to the city. They also cannot require you to improve that, that property uh, for the street widening. Um, they've identified that, you know, when you do the lot split, uh, your, your, your only residential uses may be allowed on your property. Um, again, the owner occupancy standard, uh, you know, whoever is the owner or the applicant uh, of your property has to sign an affidavit to live there for three years following the application. Uh, the and, and that's you're exempted if you're a community land trust or a nonprofit. Non-conforming zoning again, if you're, you know, if your property, if you, uh, for example, the R1 zone minimum uh, lot area threshold is uh, five thousand square feet, I believe. And so if if you're if you have a property that is 5000 square feet in the R1 zone and you want to apply for the urban lot split right then uh then you're left with theoretically two two 2500 square foot lots that would otherwise be non conforming uh you know to the zone of the property but that doesn't matter with SB9 that's still allowed right um application process so the city is has prepared a process, and this is really what we are waiting for uh, before we start submitting applications. Because before this, we didn't know what the fee was. You know, usually the city comes out with application forms for for processing applications. Where does the case go once you submit it? Is planning going to submit it? Is building and safe uh, going to process it? Is building and safety going to process it? So here they've identified that, right? They've identified they, they they're they're recognizing SB nine. They've set up an official process for these types of cases. Um, they have, they're also recognizing no public hearings are required unless you're in the coastal zone, CEQA, um, the environmental document is not uh, required for these types of approvals. Um, I've highlighted this sentence here because Article 7 is the, uh, the city's incorporation of the Subdivision Map Act, how they, that's, that's the section of code that they use to process these, these types of cases for uh, the, the, the lot split provision. If you're in a hillside uh, area, the city is going to require a geologic and soils engineering report, um, or if you're liquefaction as well. Um, but if you're not going to do the lot split application, the city is also identifying that, hey, you can go straight to plan check, right? Um, however, um, building and safety and planning will both be reviewing your application, right? Um, and even housing, I'm sure we'll will also at some point uh, have a have a, a review of the application. Uh, they've identified the fees, just less than four thousand um, dollars, and then I'm sure plus surcharges, it'll be uh, above that. Um, they've also identified impact fees, and I think we've been seeing this a lot uh, in in jurisdictions that uh, that they're this the cities uh, are still imposing in development impact fees. In this circumstance, the city is identifying uh, the LAUSD developer fee, the, par the Rec and Parks fee, and the affordable housing linkage fee. Uh, so that's the that's the SB9 me memo. Uh, I wanted to go over other documents that the city has released as a result of SB9. Uh, so here's the um, here's a, an SB9 uh, urban lot split application form. Uh, so you know some of this in the beginning is to complete be completed by city planning staff. Um, and, uh, but the majority is, you know, also for the applicant, uh, there's a, a checklist here. And, and this is, this is what I love about the city of Los Angeles, how thorough they are with their forms, right? Uh, so they really, um, have streamlined through these checklists, uh, you know, just, just check these off or is it a historic designation? Yes or no, right? If it is, sorry, can't qualify. Uh, is it in a sensitive area now? In the sensitive areas, um, if you're, you know, the city may require uh, some type of um, uh, state, either owner statement or a statement by a, a biologist mm -hmm. um, to identify if you're um, within a, um, uh, an area that's, uh, that, that might impact a sensitive uh, habitat. So they've identified that form on there as well, right? Um, you know, what's your lot size? All these, these are all the same, you know, standards that we just went through. 
um, and your deviation from development standards. Your they you know your applicant can be uh, the same as the owner or different. Uh, you know you have to sign an ownership affidavit or a letter of author authorization authorizing the um, the applicant, um, and the applicant's declaration. Um, so let's move on to the uh, the findings and special requirements. So these are in addition to the application form, the city's saying, hey, there here's the checklist. Here's everything you need to submit your application. And this is super thorough, right? You got to have your application form. You got to have a wet signature uh, on that form. You have to have your parcel map. If you're doing a pre-filing review, a certified tree report of your property, grading calculations. I mean, it just the list goes on, right? With all the, the requirements. And this is very typical for city planning applications. Um, there's technical requirements as well. What has to go on to your actual map. And this is where, you know, when we say, one of the first things you have to do when you're looking to do a, a lot split for your property is to go in uh, to, to retain a surveyor or uh, and civil engineer, right? Because you're going to have to have them prepare this map for you, right? And you're going to have to know the boundaries of your lot. So, and and we have, you know, through our program at Brickwork, we have um, identified partnerships, you know, with with firms that will do that for you as well. Uh, and then here's uh, the city's also released uh, frequently asked questions in FAQ. Um, and this is fantastic because, you know, it identifies basic questions. What does ministerial sterile mean, right? There's no, that means there's no discretion that's involved, right? With your application. Right. It's not an entitlement. It's, it, there's no public process. It's, it's as uh, close to submitting something for plan check as, as you can be, right? What are the objective standards? They've taken this definition and, and put it here, right? For your objective standard for your property. Um, what standards cannot be imposed? Uh, are there circumstances where the city uh, may require a discretionary approval? Yeah, there actually are. Uh, believe it or not, with SB9, you know, you could be in a circumstance where um, where you need a, wa a waiver that's outside of, somewhere outside of SB9 and, the, and, uh, and then would need to, um, apply for a discretionary entitlement. Um, so we'll put a link to these um, to these documents, uh, you know, along with uh, with this webinar. Uh, but you know, this is just a general overview. I'm I'm really excited about uh, about the fact that the city finally came out with their with their memorandum for processing because now we can start actually processing these types of cases, right? Absolutely. And so uh, for people that are watching right now and didn't see the previous video, so I just want to quickly go over Brickwork's role in all of this. So we identified months ago when this uh, passed that this is probably the most radical housing bill for single family zoning for California. It affects seven and a half million single family homes. Obviously, we have to filter that down to uh, which ones are qualified and not. But ideally, why we decided to lean in on this opportunity is because, you know, everyone kind of points to the Turner study and says, well, you know, utilization uh, is going to be in the less than 5% range or something like that. And sure, they're looking at it uh, from the uh, super macro point of view where, you know, most homeowners don't want their lives disrupted, don't want the added stress, don't have the wherewithal to actually go through with this process. There's supply chain issues. There's, you know, uh, a whole host of issues that come up. And so, okay, fine. That only presents that um, current climate. There, there are a lot of hurdles and new solutions to be had. So we're part of that new solution, right? It requires disruption. And so how we start is this. If you're a homeowner right now, or even real estate agent, this works for both. Mm -hmm. If you have a client that currently is looking to buy, you could utilize this, okay? Want to make that clear. It's not just for existing homeowners. Right. If you, if your homeowner right now lives in a condo, townhouse, wants to sell it, wants to rent it out, that's their, uh, you know, uh, decision to do. But they can now search for a new home, a single family home, uh, to utilize this. Now, where do they start? with us. So if you go on our website right now, we created uh, a quick way for you to request one of these reports. You can register, but you can also email us. And a lot of homeowners have just wanted a quick link to, to pay and not register. So we created both avenues and we've been getting a lot of people, homeowners and real estate agents included, that are requesting these reports. So we'll go through the state and also the, uh, you know, the jurisdictional ordinances uh, to 
come up with two scenarios for you, uh, you know, that could point uh, the homeowner or the home buyer in the right direction. And of course, then we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, put them in the waiting list right now for that partnership program, where if they want, we can set up a partnership 50-50, but that is subject to underwriting. So I want to highlight that we're underwriting certain homes and neighborhoods to see if it's a right fit for this program. But we're also developing another program where if you said homeowner is, are still interested in this, by all means, we will go ahead and put you in touch with the investor list that we are generating right now in the developer list who also want to partner with you with capital to do this, right? And so everyone has specific criteria regarding neighborhoods, regarding the type of uh, program and build. So that's what we're filtering uh, in-house right now to do. So if you're watching right now for the first time, reach out to us to start the process for figuring out if your home or if your potential new home qualifies. So that I want to uh, make sure to, to, to get out right away. But yeah, super excited. I think this is, I think most, we were waiting for the city of LA because again, it is the jurisdiction or the city that other municipalities will then follow suit or change. And so even the, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Alex, even some of the municipalities that came off the gate and, and issued an uh, urgency or an emergency ordinance, that is kind of a placeholder or temporary solution, right? It wasn't, so maybe they were waiting for the city of LA to issue theirs to then maybe revise their ordinance or that it could be kind of, uh, uh, you know, a preview or uh, a way that they can align themselves to also copy or follow suit, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, look, uh jurisdictions look to other jurisdictions to, to, to as kind of a guidance of how to incorporate state law into their local code, you know, and, and getting some ideas from what, uh, ta and takeaways from what other jurisdictions are doing. Um, you know, to the extent that's happening, you know, they, who knows, right? I mean, that's, it's kind of, uh, you know, based on each jurisdiction individually. Um, but, you know, LA is, is pretty progressive when it comes to housing and their ideas and their plan, incorporating planning rules. Um, I mean, the TOC guidelines was a fantastic uh, way of producing housing. And I think it has produced a lot of housing. They incorporated the accessory dwelling unit ordinance, you know, which um, has uh, equally uh, produced a lot of housing within single family properties and even multifamily. Um, and, and, and identifying uh, the, the accessory dwelling unit ordinance into the SB9 memo. Um, you know, rule uh, that that even um, is is another way of incorporating additional housing uh, and and options with SB nine. Um, you know, we're in a housing crisis right now, John, and that's why you and I uh, are so focused on brickwork. You know, currently uh, because you know anything we can do to help get people housed within the state, we will. Yeah, and I just so, posted something on LinkedIn. Rents are up in the LA, greater LA metro region, 19% year over year. So the average rent right now wow. is $3,000. It's up 19%. And the housing supply is down, down to three months. So just if, if, if people don't understand what that means, it means that there is not enough supply. In a healthy market, you should have at least six to 12 months of supply it's down to three. So if you have less inventory and you have rents going up, it constricts and it keeps going up. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we feel SB9 is a perfect solution where we can get buy right ministerial units out into the market, right? That's available to people that are looking to rent. And ultimately, sure, it's gonna drive down rent increases, but that's what that's the whole goal, right? We don't want rents to keep going up and supply and, and prices to go up. There needs to be a stabilization and a normalization event. And that is not currently happening at the pace uh, that, that we're seeing and a lot of uh, people are seeing. So SB9 isn't the, the go-to, it's going to solve every problem. No, we mm -hmm. recognize it's not either, but it's definitely a part of the solution. And the fact that if homeowners or agents don't know what, I have conversations all the time, Alex, right? Where I, even yesterday, hey, does anyone here in the table know what SB9 is? Blank faces. I have no clue mm. what is that. So it's our job to get this message across. At, and we're not trying to say it's the right solution for you, but you should at least know this mm. opportunity, what this opportunity uh, is. So, 
Okay, well, <laughs> thank you, Alex. Uh, I'm glad we had this uh, redo uh, on this video. You know, for everyone watching, we're gonna try our best to get more content out to you, okay? So we successfully, uh, uh, you know, uh, closed our uh, rolling close on WeFunder round, yay! So we can, we have the capital, we're gonna bring on a full uh, time team or a full, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, a team to help us really uh, get be able to communicate to as many homeowners about what this is and then process the reports and also then finalize these partnerships so we can get uh these um applications in and we could start to get the units built okay so we're super excited about that stay tuned please subscribe to our youtube channel and uh we'll come out with the, another video thank you so much alex really appreciate it Thanks, John, and thanks everybody for listening. I hope you found this informative. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Contact at brickwork.la uh, or our website, brickwork.la. Thanks a lot.